uh, and finding innovative ways uh, of becoming more disaster wise um, in terms of our community and we're going to make sure that we roll that out. So one of our biggest culprits within this uh, fire was the issue of invasive plant material. And we plan to use the, that exact material to build labor intensive, uh, cost effective, fire resistant homes. And as we are speaking, we are busy just in the final stages to identify a site for us to have this uh, lighthouse as a show house put up where people can actually go and see it and demonstrations will be done as to show exactly how fire resistant it is. The fire also has left us with um, bare slopes um, and extremely exposed erosion. And we have acquired, as you have seen all over in the media, uh, erosion control materials that are, um, um, you know, are used. And so those are just some of the things that I would like to highlight. Surely I want to also at this point thank each and every one that has come on board to assist the Neisner, greater Neisner area with regards to relief, whether it was humanitarian or other, and still doing that. And a number of um, exceptional residents within our town has actually came out and they are really assisting us in a, in a great way, in an amazing way. And we have even made contact with them and make sure that we are now collaborating with such organizations and individuals. I would like to say in closing that I would like to thank you all once again for your attendance and always making sure that you have the greater niceness area's interest at heart. But please allow me now at this point to introduce you to those of you who don't know him yet, Mr. Cam Chetty, our municipal manager. Um, very competent, may I say, and it's been quite a journey working with Mr. Chetty. Also very challenging for him taking over just after the disaster. But I must say, up until now, we've handled it well, and it is actually a great pleasure to work with him, Mr. Chetty. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, for the confidence in me, and to all the fellow journalists, as well as the professionals seated at the, at the rear. I think, just to set the context, uh, this particular briefing was designed to try and foster uh, transparency. I think it's important for good governance that this municipality uh, believes in and to be transparent about our findings in the best way and the most professional way as possible. I think secondly, we desperately need your assistance. And I'm saying that because in the current post-truth environment, as well as you know, the notion of and the explosion of social media that's around. We need your assistance to A, dispel any myths that are around, but also these myths create a bad impression of the municipality and sometimes create an impression where, the, where we ourselves may not believe it. So I think what's, what's important is, and we'll talk about that later, it's critical that you address those particular myths around that. And I think this report will try and be as scientific as possible, and in it we're trying to be as professional as possible to show you how we arrived at the, at the conclusions we did. In addition to that, I think what the mayor said is critical. To summarize that, there are three areas post-fire. I think the first one is that we need to deal with all the mitigation issues. And in terms of the mitigation issues, we're looking at any particular threats, whether it's the slopes and potential of landslides and so on that we need to address, and the potential of any other fires that arise. The second area is reconstruction. And simultaneously, we're built on a reconstruction path and you can see the cranes already when you go up to places like uh, you know, White Location and others. And thirdly, we need to build resilience. And what the mayor was saying is, in our lifetime, living in this particular wonderful environment, we need to adapt to the environment, and we need to be resilient to any possible fires that take place thereafter, but we, need, we also need to be prepared to do so. 
That requires, I think, and we need your help again in this, to create an awareness around fire safety, as well as you know, <coughs> preserving our resources, particular water resources, given the droughts that we face as well. So I think those are the three themes that we want to encourage this afternoon. <coughs> I think what I want to do next is introduce our Chief Fire Officer, Clinton Manuel. I think he's familiar to a number of you. Clinton Manuel is our Chief uh, Fire Officer for the Nisner Fire and Rescue Services, and he's been here since uh, January uh, 2015. But just to summarize, he has a bachelor's degree in public management. He has a higher diploma in fire services technology, uh, and that is accredited by the South African Emergency Services Institute. And he has a national diploma in fire services technology from CUPT, or CPUT, from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. In addition to that, you know, his CV is an illustrious one. But I think more importantly, since 1993, he's been involved in a number of forensic investigations on fire. All of those investigations have gone unchallenged, or whether they were challenged, right? his version still managed to be sustainable. And some of the fires, the big large fires that he's been involved in, is in the Camps Bay one while he was in Cape Town, he's been involved in forensics in the Strandfontein one, the big fire in Lakeside and the Southern Peninsula area, the other ones are Tafelberg and Kaiserkracht areas. In addition to that, he's also been involved in the forensics of specialist types of fires, and this is the hotel in Lansdowne, as well as we all know the Ilda pa Payne one that was here. So his conclusions, I think, have been verified and stood, I think, the test of a, not, of a lot of interrogation, and we have absolute confidence in his professional capability. In that so I want to now hand you over, and I'll come back to the end and maybe summarize, to Clinton Manuel, who is our fire services uh, officer, chief fire services officer, who will elaborate on his findings after his lengthy and professional investigation. Thanks very much. Thank you, MM. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. If Graham can just get us going with that PowerPoint. Uh, sharing it to the uh, external people. So we have about 22, I think, people online uh, on our Skype International. So this is being uh, this is being streamed live. We broadcast live. Can you switch on the lights, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Just a little bit of history about the Nisner Fire and Rescue Service because this becomes important when you get to understand the response to this fire. Uh, Nisner has two fully manned fire stations. One is in Sedgefield and one is in uh, Nisner itself. And then we have one substation that's up at Concordia. We also have one volunteer who's a municipal employee. We've got a fire engine up at Karatera, and he makes use of that fire engine. And we've got another volunteer up in the Rienendal area. Those two are municipal employees who do standby duties for the, for the fire and rescue service. Right from the beginning, these, and you might have seen these five pillars before, uh, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, the drought, the topography, the fuel. And then we know we had berg winds for about three days before the 7th of June. And then on the morning of the 7th of June, we had those strong winds. Now these, let's go back. These five pillars existed together. But all it needed was a flame, a spark somewhere for these pillars to actually then combine and form this devastating fire. My investigation was twofold. Number one, it pointed to the origin of the fire, where we cannot clearly say where the origin of the fire is. And secondly, to find a probable cause of the fire. And hopefully that cause will be able to bring these five pillars together uh, that actually contribute to this devastating fire. We had three fires on the morning of 7th June. 
Now, what we do know now, although the, the Elan's Crow fire is represented as happening at 15 minutes past six, uh, please note that these are the times that the fire service received the calls, the first alert to the fire service. So the fire service originally went to a Christfunt, the fire out at Christfontein. That's a fire that spread all the way down to Plettenberg Bay, and that was at half past three in the morning. At quarter past four in the morning, we were alerted to a fire at Lanswood, where the Sedgefield Fire Department, the guys at the Sedgefield Fire Station went to. And only at quarter past six in the morning did we receive the first call to the fire at Elanskraal. The sequence of events after that, when the fire was reported at quarter past six, is that the volunteer at Karatara responded first, and he was on scene at 20 past six. <coughs> Sedgefield was then in attendance at the Lancet fire, were redirected to Elanska, they arrived there at 10 to seven. The investigative method that I used was the first flight over the area was done in the morning. I'm sorry, it must be 8th of June. Um, you'll recall that on the, on the 7th, no helicopters could fly because of that strong wind. And as soon as we had an opportunity to fly out, we went into a UE, and that was on the 8th of June already. It was then already that my observations and my investigation started as to where the fire originated. And there are clear patterns that I will show you later that I observed on that morning of the 8th of June. <coughs> Subsequent to that, I was sent emails from a gentleman by the name of Richie Morris out in the Elan's Kral area. And these emails are very important because in those emails include photos um, as well as grid patterns. Several times I've been in the area to investigate the area I've been on the ground. Um, we then photograph the area by making use of a professional photographer. And by now you all should be familiar with the Dr. Wallace Fosler report. That report I had to include in my investigation because it contains certain information. Um, the station commander in Sedgefield, Wayne Stearns, have also submitted a report uh, because he plays a part in where the fire was reported. I looked at the weather pattern, and I can tell you now these weather patterns was actually contained in Dr. Foster's report, uh, but they are very significant in terms of determining the spread of the fire. Uh, we found an eyewitness whom I interviewed personally. Uh, unfortunately for us, this eyewitness would not give a statement to the police. Uh, but we know exactly what this eyewitness is. The evidence which I collected, obviously, was the emails from Richie Morris. Richie Morris then reports photos of a smoldering fire prior to 7th of June. Uh, and I'll show you the photographs as well. And then we also went out and photographed the same smolder, which you'll see the photographs as well. There are several aerial photos that we took. And then we took photos of structures in what I refer to as the non V pattern, but I will refer to that during the slide when you'll see the picture that I'm referring to. We also took photos of the burn scar with the V pattern, with the scar that presents the V pattern. And then there are ground photos of both the non V section and the V section. The email of Richie Morris, as early as 10th of May uh, 2017, the fire happened on the 7th of May, so this smolder, which is reporting there, you'll see it there, the smoke coming out the valley, is first reported by Richie Morris. Reference to this smolder we're drawing is the buildings in the background where we can actually reference this photograph. On this photograph, you will see, and this photograph is supplied by Richie Morris, uh, the wind is blowing from the direction of the northwest, See a lot of smoke and then the smoke trailing off this way, which tells that this fire, the smolder is somewhere in this area. I want you to note this section here, because this section will come into play a little bit later on, on separate photos after the, the, the fire. When you look at the circle that Richie Morris provides, and there's the inside of that photo, he puts the smoke, the smolder in that area in the yellow area. Um, remember I showed you that section that said you must take note of? That is somewhere in this area. <clears throat> On the 23rd of June, the photo is date stamped, this email is also sent to me. In the background there is the same heap. Let's call it the heap. 
Um, and you can see there is a burn scar on it. Uh, wanting to look closely, you, you see the smoke, and you can still see the background houses. So we know that the photo is taken in the same direction. Uh, Richie Morris then provides this grid map, and there you will see an arrow, a red arrow, pointing to where the smolder is. I want to point out to you that the report of Dr. Foster suggests the fire started there. Richie Morris sends further photos, and I'll just run through this briefly. Uh, this is post the fire, uh, where you can still once again see the smoke. This photo was taken on the 12th of July, after the fire. Somewhere there is Richie Morris' property, and you can see where the smoke is emanating from, and you can look at the air, it's extremely steep slope, um, very difficult to gain access to this area. Now, in the email correspondence that Richie Morris provides, there's a lot of mention being made about inaccessible areas. There was also WhatsApp sent to the station commander at Sedgefield Wayne Stinsoff stating about inaccessible, and one can determine on this photo how inaccessible the area is. This smolder is still there after the fire, and you will see around it there is nothing what we call in the black that shows that the area burned. From this photo and comparing it to the previous photo, it is evident that the smolder with Richie Morris reported on the 10th of May was still smoldering on the 12th of July. And this has been the problematic area where a lot of people and a lot of you have reported and asked me questions about it, about the smoldering fire. You can see how inaccessible the area is, um, but what we do know is that this fire, this smoke here, presents absolutely no flame, and it just shows a lot, a lot of smoke. At this point, I'm going to, to, to just a little bit of information about underground fires. What we do know in the fire department and as firefighters that any fire, your, your fire behavior, you need to have heat, oxygen, and fuel. Uh, that's your fire triangle. In a building fire, we put the fourth element, which is the chemical tri triangle or the chemical reaction, making it the fire tetrahedron. With vegetation fires, we still use heat, oxygen, fuel. But then we bring in topography as the fourth one. The topography here you can see is very steep. It's a lot of vegetation around it. I think many of you, if you're in Neister, will be familiar with the fires at the Green Dump site. It smolder for weeks and months, and it never comes out of there. The very same scenario applies to fires like this, where the fire will smolder underground for a long time. With those kind of fires, you have the two elements very strongly present. It's heat. Oxygen. However, uh, what limits the fire in coming out from under there is fuel. Because underground you probably find compacted soil, you probably find roots that's moist, and there's not really dry fuel. If you make a bright fire, you will understand, you'll realize you need fire lighters or starter fires. And with this kind of fire that we've got smoldering here still, it's almost impossible for that fire to develop into a fully conflagrated fire or flaming fire because it lacks that one element. What we do know from this photo is that the smolder which is reported on the 10th of May survived those strong winds of 7, July, of 7 June and also the strong winds of 8 June. And this fire remained underground and it is still underground. To give you more or less a direction of the fire, you'll see there at sea, there's that smolder. Okay, we point there. Uh, this is now taken from the opposite side. Remember the buildings I showed you in the background photo? We tried to replicate it by going in reverse. Now, Richie Morris property is there. From his photo that I showed you initially, the 10th May photo, you see the buildings where we are now hovering over to take a reverse photo. Richie Morris sees the smoke coming from that fire, which is there. He doesn't see where it emanates from, but the smoke blowing across in that direction with the northwester behind it. B is what we call the plowed lands at the Blanche property. And it's to give you an indication where about we are in terms of that smolder there. This is what we call the non V pattern. You will see here, there is no distinctive V pattern by which fire is spread. 
This is the area where I said you must take note of. That smolder is somewhere on this ridge, this side. And this is in the background. This is the entire area where Dr. Foster puts where the fire originated from. But here, the problem is, you see these two lines where the fire go up, you don't see a V pattern that's a synonymous with the way fire spread. At the bottom here, and I looked at this vegetation very carefully, it's called what, what we in the fire service know as a die out pattern. You will see from the black, the fire goes to the brown and then into the green, which indicates that the fire could possibly have burned downhill and then die out by itself in this area. I want to point you out to two fingers which I found here as well. With these two fingers, we found that this fire burned actually back towards it. If one go and we visit that area, you can see that the fire died out in those two areas where it comes back onto, onto those sections. This is a photo from a separate angle now showing the steepness of the slope and where this die out area is the, at the bottom. Had the fire originated somewhere here, it would have showed a V pattern from at the bottom. This photograph is taken in the burn scar, um, in that um, slope going uphill where we call the non V pattern. And you will see here there's a deep, deep scar on this tree trunk. You will see Richie Morris property in the background. You also see scarring on this tree trunk. There are one of two ways that could have happened. What we do know is the fire burning uphill will cause scarring on this side as well. But what we also do know is this. If a fire comes down slowly against the slope, it burns slower and it could have caused these deep V patterns. Indicating to us that the fire on that non V pattern came from, the, from this direction and not uphill. This is another photo, downhill, that is what we call that burn out area at the bottom there. And you will see a deep scar on this tree trunk. This is downhill towards that deep, steep slope at the bottom, all in the non V area. Once again, you can see this deep scar on this tree, suggesting the longer burn was from this side. Also in the same area, this goes up slope. You will see charring there. At the bottom here, there's roots. Now, during fire investigation, we look for the exposed side and the protected side. What you will see here on this side of the root, here, where it was exposed, yet on the inside of the root, where this goes uphill, there are protected areas, which once again indicates that the fire could have burned down slope. Very close to that non V pattern area, we found this pottery pile, uh, which suggests to us that there was access to that area, which contradicts what Richie Morris and Mr. Duplessis reports to Mr. Stinsdorf that the area is totally inaccessible. There's a clear path in the area. Further that way and going down there is the area that I want to show you which becomes the V pattern area. The pottery pile is at the top there, clear access road, and this down to the bottom here is what we refer to as the V pattern area. The non V pattern area is in that area, that side. This is fondly called Noah's Ark. To the west side of it is where we know that that non-V scar and the V scar is. To the east of it is where things become a bit complicated. And you will see here burn damage on the eastern side of Noah's Ark. On these logs as well, which also suggests that this fire moved in this direction in this particular area. This is a shed just to the right. Noah's Ark is now positioned here. This to the right of Noah's Ark. I want you to note there's no damage on this side. This container was placed after the fire. But when you look at this, there's no damage on this side and also the steel column here. There's no damage to it. However, on the other side of the shed, from the east, we find this damage and quite extensive damage to the shed on this side and also on these logs. 
When one look at these logs, that's to the east, this is west. When you look here, suggest to me that this fire, the burn pattern shows that this log was burning from that side and not from this side. Uh, which once again shows that this fire was burning in this direction towards that none V pattern. There are electrical poles in the area as well. Ground is fairly level at that area. And all the damage that I found was on the eastern side. All the charring on these poles. This is taken from the east. More photos from the eastern side. And then it brings us to this section. That non-V pattern area is here. You'll see it clear on a different picture. This area here poses a distinctive V pattern. Okay. Right at the bottom here is a clearing, probably about four by six meters, and I'll show you more pictures of that clearing. That is the first building in its path, which showed extensive damage from this side. And I'll show you pictures as well. Noah's Ark and that shed is along that section going towards the west on this photo. The clearing I'm referring to is here, right at the bottom of the V. You will see the scorching of light fuels in the area because the heavier fuels are not burned yet. The heavier fuels only burn here. And that's very distinctive and the pattern that a wildfire follows. In this clearing, probably leaves, very light tinder was burning first. And once that became quite nice and ignited, the wind then took it into that V and it spread further. As you see here, the fire intensifying and spreading in its path towards that side. This is the access to that V section. Here you will see there's evidence of humans having been down there. Uh, we suspect that these branches might have blown over here, but other than that, it's a well-traveled road or access path to the bottom. I also found the remains of this drum in that V section. Once again, proving that humans had access to that area before. This photo here, this slide, sorry, this slide, you will see the scorched tree trunk. I find this tree trunk a little bit out of place if one put it in its location where it is. You will see very younger trees which are not burned, yet you see severe scarring on this trunk. And this tree trunk could only have been brought into that area. It could not possibly have burned there. There's absolutely no trees around it or trunks that actually resemble this. However, when I sat with the CSIR at Stellenbosch University about this particular one year, the conclusion is that this tree trunk could have burned before the 7th of June. Because if one actually look at it clearly, it, it shows more older charring than recent charring. But what places the street trunk at a bit of an awkward position is, this is the scorch on the ground, which is light fuels as you see it, and yet you find heavy fuels that burn without igniting these tree trunks. This tree trunk could possibly have been brought into the area and on previous occasions having been burned in that clearing. This is all in that clearing which I showed you from the, from the air. We also found the stacked heavy material in that clearing. Um, it's stacked, which probably shows you that somebody made a fire down at the bottom. What we do know is that there are absolutely no pine trees in that area or near that area. Yet we found pine cones in that clearing. These are the pine cones that's all photographed. Some of them shows evidence of having been lit before the fire, older charring on it. And some of it shows more recent charring. There's a pine cone. There's another one. Uh, yeah, this is the one I want to stand on a bit. From this angle, it's a bit bad. I can't see it clearly. So I'm looking at the screen as well. The pine cones, this is also a pretty older one, which we found in the area. This one here is a lot more recent. With CSIR, we looked at this pine cone, and there's another photo I'm going to show you, this arrangement of the pine cone and the stacked material here. 
I think common and we all know that pine cones sometimes get used as fire lighters. You put him upside down and people light him. Remember I told you that there are no pine trees in the area. What did the pine cones be doing in that area with the stacked material? And this is in the clearing at the bottom of that V section. Between the CSRI researchers and myself, we concluded that this is probably the most recent fire if one compare the burnt char and the age of the burnt char with burnt material in the area which we know burnt on the 7th of June. So this probably becomes that element that sets us five pillars in motion on the morning of the 7th of June. Once again, ladies and gents, the inclusion of the pine cones in that area where we found these pine cones and the heavy material, those logs, could only have gotten there by humans taking it down there. Because you can go look at the area, there are no pine, co pine trees growing in that area. This is a photo of the V pattern. And at the bottom here, you can see the charting on this side. This is going uphill where it starts consuming all the heavy fuels. So here you can see that clearing is bit to the bottom here. Uh, it starts consuming heavier fuels and forming this charting there. I also found evidence of previous fires in the area. This is a pottery pile. In this pile you find ash, you find remnants of nails, um, which shows you that people probably used planks. In there. It's a lot of broken pottery, and but you, you can see that it's within that area. So there's once again evidence of fires having been made previous occasions in that particular area. Here's another pile. I think we found three piles of pottery. Okay. This was the other recent fire. There are some green glasses in between, and then there's evidence of which could only have been planks. Because you will see nails in this heap. This is also in that V pattern. However, uh, this, this one here is not close down to that clearing where the pine cone is. So the pine cone and the arranged uh, heavy fuel around it is lower down than this photo. But this photo also then once again shows that there could have been planks in the area which could only have been taken down by humans and that was burned down at the bottom. This building is the first building that burned. It's right in that V pattern. The most severe damage is from this side with the V fanning out in this. This building was completely in that section. I want to compare you with this building to Noah's Ark and the shed. We here have found a lot of damage. The extent, it's in fact obliterated on this side where we know the fire spread up. In comparison to the Noah's Ark and the shed which had damage from this side, but slight. What I can tell you about this photo and what the evidence shows is that this building here was completely in the path of that V. Uh, the V starting at the bottom here and spreading out and taking the brunt of the heat and the velocity of this fire. In applying the scientific method in investigating this fire, I to apply, well, came up with two hypotheses. Hypothesis 1 is based on the Foster report that the fire started in the non V area, that heap that I showed you. And that the fire was caused by lightning on 12th of April 2017. That forms the basis of Hypothesis 1. Hypothesis 2 is that the fire originated in the V pattern area and it is probably man made and not an act of God. In testing hypothesis one, I to consider, sorry, both Richie Morris and Dr. Foster reports, and they both report only one smolder. There's never ever been a report of a second smolder. The Richie Morris photos which I showed you, and where he puts the location where that smolder is taking place. On the 30th of April, Sternsdorf, Station Commander in Sedgefield, went out to the area after a Len Duplessis reported the smolder, which is in the Richie Morris photos. Stones have get pointed into an area that actually matches the location of Richie Morris smolder. 
he was put, you've seen the, seen the photo there of Noah's Ark, he was put on a ladder, and he was pointed in a location on the opposite ridge, where if you added Noah's Ark, the fire originated completely to the left. Then I found an eyewitness, and I spoke to this gentleman, I interviewed him, and he also confirms the modest and the sensitive location of the fire. The wind pattern supplied by Dr. Foslu, it's in his report. Some of you might have seen his report. There's a graph in there. Um, and what I also know is that Foslu cannot be used as an eyewitness in testing his, hypothes his hypothesis because he was not in Elon's on the 7th of June. This was confirmed by his attorney who communicated to me via email. So I cannot actually use Foslu then as an eyewitness. Testing hypothesis two. Once again, the emails and photos and the grids from Richie Morris, which you saw early on. The aerial photographs that we took. My investigation on the ground. Then I looked at both the V-pattern and the non-V-pattern areas. I'll show you the photos where the fire could pass you in the non-V-pattern where it shows the fire went downhill. And in the V-pattern area where you saw the log access... You saw all the possible fires, and you saw those the pine cones, and then you also saw there that the fire could have spread uphill. The weather data, as Dr. Foster includes in his report, and then I need to show you this burn scar together with this weather data. This is the burn scar, and I hope it's clear to you guys, because from here it's not that clear. Um, the... What we, what we do know is that the shed and the um, Noah's Ark is situated around about here. Around about here is where I found that V pattern. Around about here, this is where Dr. Foster claims the fire originated. From this, you can see that this fire spread all the way. You can see the spotting fires over there to the other side. The Duplessis house is approximately in that location there where the fire spread from. And from here the fire spread down to Neisner, where it came down on Neisner, right at the White Bridge, which is about way further back there. I want to point you to this ridge, where we know that that smolder is currently still smoldering. It's on this ridge. The Ritchie Morris property is somewhere here. The plowed lands I showed you is that there. I want you to note that the plowed lands here, there's also a burn scar, because that becomes important now when I'm going to try and analyze and explain to you the weather pattern as well as the possible direction that this fire spread. Okay, this is a slightly better picture of the previous one. I think this one is... Oh... And somehow Chamisa, you never copied my other slides in it. Chamisa? My other slides. The ones with the arrows. It's not in there. Okay. Yeah, I need to, I need to, you need to see actually the weather pattern. I'm just going to shake that. Okay, what, what I'm going to try and show you is that what we do know, the weather pattern on the moon, from about, and in, in Dr. Foster's report, there's a lot of elements in Dr. Foster's report that is very applicable in terms of where the fire, the time of the origin of the fire, and if one takes into account his weather data from where the fire spread. Um, Graham, in the meantime, could you check on that, on that the stick if there is another slide another PowerPoint presentation, the original one. I think the original one is still in there. Sorry, ladies and gents, we copied it onto the Nazi municipality background slides, and it seems that not everything copied over. Yeah. What we know from the weather pattern, and this is what we're going to try and show you, um, is that the wind first came south southwest from this direction? Okay, sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah. If you can, if you can just move all the way down, go all the way down to further down, further, further down. go back. Okay, I'll control it from here. You just put it on slideshow for me. Okay. It's not on slideshow. Okay, there we go. This is that same area. What we do know, and this is the data that and you know, that Dr. Foster supplied, supplied uh, what we know is that from 9 minutes past 1 in the morning, between 9 minutes past 1 and 0132, the wind speed was between 20 and 40 kilometers per hour, and it came from the south-southwest. Now, if one consider the wind coming from the south-southwest, yeah, you probably just need to sit there. Yeah, just. And with the wind coming from the south-southwest, it spread the fire in this direction. If you can maybe just press enter there. Okay. Where that's a possible spread. That takes into account how the fire could have ended up there. Remember all reports has been that the fire came from the northwest. But what we do know from the weather pattern as early as that, it went there. And that is a scorch there as well where the fire went to. Had the fire originated here, as per Dr. Foster's report... This fire would have gone there. If we just press enter again, there. It would have spread in this direction, and we see absolutely no burn scar there. Okay? So, is it probable that the fire started in this non V pattern? I now have a non V pattern, and I also have the wind direction that put, had it started here, it would have gone that way. I've got this wind direction from here, with, we know the fire, that V section is about there. And that could have contributed to that, with the wind being south southwest bound. Go to the next slide, Graham. Okay. If I dispel the Foslu report that the fire started there, and we continue with the wind south southwest, let's go again, Graham. Okay, which shows you that where this fire could have gone to. Go again, Graham. Then we know the wind came west northwest between. This is the next wind direction, 0132 and 0154. And that took the fire in that direction where you can see where it went to. Okay, go next one. We then know the next wind was at 40 to 50 kilometers per hour uh, from the northwest. Press enter again. And that causes the fire to jump to that ridge and then spreading to the Johnson property which is on that side. You will then once again see, had the fire been there and going across, that all of this would have been affected as well. But in this case, we know that this fire spots over to that side because there are V patterns on that side as well. Go again, Graham. The next wind came from the west, and that's just after 2 o'clock in the morning, which then takes the fire further that way and further this way. Now, Dr. Foster's home is about there. In his report, he says that his home burned down at 17 minutes past 5 in the morning. And that puts it a lot in perspective. If one take that, he says, at definitely at 17 minutes past 5 in the morning, his home burned down. How does wind pattern play a role? Because remember we said it went that way, then it goes that way, and now it goes to the westerly direction, which would have taken his house out, which is about in that area. Go again, Greg. <coughs> Press again. You will then see at about, well, between the time from the 0239 and 0324, and the wind reaching a speed of 60 kilometers per hour in this valley. And uh, when you look at the topography, you find that this forms its own microclimates, and the fire generates its own thermal wave at the front of it. Where the wind then takes it further down, and I suspect it is this wind that takes out the Johnson home. And then also bearing down on the fossil home and taking out a whole lot of structures in its way and spreading it towards Neisner. Again, Graham? Between 0347 and 0410, we know that the wind was blowing strong northwest at 60 kilometers per hour. And this takes it all the way into Neisner. 
when you look at the burn scar and analyzing this weather pattern, you can see the probability that that's happened. <coughs> the wind then changes at 10 past 4 in the morning and it came from the north. Please again, Greg. And you can see it pushes it here. However, on this ridge and in this valley here, of the following is probably probable. Please again, Greg. Where that red arrow moves to, it's very probable based on the burn scar and the patterns of the flame from that side on this entire area, that in this valley, the wind comes from the north, but because of the terrain, it pushes the fire back to this side. And that probably accounts for the fact that I see a lot of burn damage from the easterly side, all along here. And I also see the downslope damage here. Because when one look at the terrain and one take into account these valleys, this is the probability that this fire being pushed by that northerly wind, where we know it was blowing very strong from the north, from here, and then pushing this fire down to here, and also causing this die out pattern at the bottom here, where the fire was actually burning against itself in the latter stages. At 17 minutes past 5, Dr. Fosloo's weather station stops reporting the wind patterns because his house burns down at that stage. Go to the next slide, Graham. Okay. In choosing a final hypothesis, what we do know about wildfires is that they first ignite light fuels and then spread to heavy fuels. That is very, very evident in that clearing at the bottom where you saw that burn scar or the scorching and you don't see heavy fuels burning there. What we also know in terms of fire behavior of wildland fires is that the fire then forms a distinctive V pattern. We've got an area that shows that. We also know that there were heavy fuels found in that clearing. And for the sake of explanation, I'm going to take the pine cones and that stacked material, the wood around it, as heavy fuels and not being leaf litter. We know that the pine cones are totally out of place in that clearing because there are no pine trees. There's no possible way the wind could have blown it all there. I also know that that charred logs are totally out of place in that clearing as well. And what we do know is that there are very clear access paths in that area. We also know there's been previous human activity down in that clearing and in that V section. And we've got evidence of previous fires. And then we've got that wind data and the fire spread I showed you on the previous slides, the, the way the fire was spreading. And in coming to that final hypothesis, I need to take all these into account. And these are scientifically, it's not about me saying this is what happened. This is the scientific approach on coming to this final hypothesis. Um, the evidence on the ground, the wind pattern, what we found burned first, it's all scientifically analyzed in coming to this final hypothesis. Next one, Graham. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, our finding is on two things. The one is the origin and then the probable cause. Having applied the scientific method of investigating this fire, the origin I find is in that V-shaped that area where there is a clear V pattern in that area. I also know that the first ignition point occurred in that clearing and I want to put it down the smoking gun being the pine cone, upside down pine cone together with the stacked wood around it. It's in the clearing at the bottom. Somebody probably made a fire at the bottom there. The probable cause comes down to that pine cone and the stacked heavy fuels that was first ignited in that area. Evidence at the bottom there shows clearly that there was a fire made and unfortunately what I need to say is that in that clearing that we found right at the bottom, at the bottom point of the V, where these things are situated, the pine cones, the fuels, there's evidence of previous fires there's the quite significant behavior of a wildfire starting uh, where it scorches the ground, lights the leaves, the light litter, and then from there consuming heavier fuels. Uh, so yeah, my origin, 
of God in there. And then the probable cause would be that uh, pine cones at the bottom. Next one, Graham. I also want to just briefly talk about, before I take questions, the first fire the fire department report responded to, which was the Kreisfontein fire. What we do know in the Kreisfontein fire is that that fire was also man-made. Uh, there we found just below Damsabos, if you go out towards Kreisfontein on the left-hand side, uh, where we found evidence of somebody who was probably sleeping in the bush there. Uh, MTO there said they've had a problem with this person for quite a while. Uh, that is the, 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 the first fire we, res we responded to. But what we do know now in terms of the time frames that we took from the Dr. Foster report, he's got a heat map in his report as well. Those of you who have seen his report, what we do know is that the Elas Graal fire was first ignited, but it was reported a lot later. In comparison to the Kreisfontein fire, which started later, but it was reported earlier. The Kreisfontein fire is the one that eventually burned all the way down to Plettenberg Bay. And when the wind turned, changed direction on the 8th, um, it's actually the one that came back on Nutsi and Pazula. Uh, a lot of people believe that the fire jumped the heads and went across. What I found from, from, from um, CSIR and using the AFIS data, if you actually date stamp the heat source, where it shows that in the Pazula area, the fire actually only burns on the 8th. And what we do know is that the fire burnt there on the 8th. But the Kreisfontein fire, is, and we need to look at it as separate, although it looks at as one big fire, it is actually two separate fires, where the Kreisfontein one burnt first, or we went out there first, while the Elanskara fire was probably just coming out of that ridge, and only reported at quarter past six in that morning. All right, a very good afternoon. Uh, those are live proceedings from Nisno. Media briefing to outline the details and events surrounding the fires that gutted most of the region for days and multiple lives were lost due to the fast spreading fires. The municipal mayor said this was the worst fire since 1869, and in total, seven people lost their lives. Mr. Clinton Manil, the chief fire officer, said that during the investigations, they uncovered that there was an underground fire that could have possibly been started by someone because they found, among other things, logs and tree trunks that had to have been carried there by human beings. They also found pine cones in an area with absolutely no pine trees. And this, of course, leading to the conclusion that at least one of the three fires was actually started by humans. Let's take a quick ad break now and start the bulletin afresh after that. What guides us? Is it something you can see? We need deliverance from sin because God never Hear. Feel. Or touch. What leads us on to greater experiences? Is it the words of our sacred texts? The advice of our elders? Or is it the actions of our people? The strength of our beliefs? Or the voices of our citizens? Your country is guided by the voices of its people. And your broadcaster is dependent on your voice to guide it. Get your copy of the SABC's editorial policy and have... ...the five, because in this report you will see the heat maps and those kind of things, which only tells me that he compiles his report after the 7th of June and not prior to the 7th of June. And his report is submitted to show you that a fire actually occurred. My report goes in terms of the scientific investigation 
and using data, the weather pattern, getting on the ground, photographing the area, and taking all of these and putting it into a report, and hence the report only coming, being released today. Uh, so it's not something where a week after a fire occurred, especially a fire of this magnitude, where you can just go and say, I've done my investigation and the report is done. Yeah, so that's probably the reason for the delay. And, and I really don't want to call it a delay because there's been previous fires, fires in Cape Town, where probably four or five months later only the reports are released. Uh, so we, and I think from our perspective, we are well within a reasonable time frame of submitting a report or releasing a report. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to our fire chief. Thanks, Clinton, very much. Just, just to recap, I think uh, for me what's important is that A, this report is driven by two things. One is the application of a proper scientific methodology, and two, it's the facts. So, so what we, we're not going into is the realm of where we're going to postulate about certain things and so on. What we are focusing on is what does the facts say in this regard? So what we can say at this point in time is clearly there's a clearing, and the point at which the fire started, we now know for certain, with a high degree of probability, statistical probability, that's where the fire started. Why do we say so? A, because we've seen access roads to that particular point, and we've seen fires, the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the origin of that particular fire, you could see the material that was brought in was foreign material. So foreign material that was brought in, which is consistent with some kind of human activity to start fires, is a third major one. And the last thing is that if we look at, what's the fancy word, the thermal wave and the patterns, but effectively the scarring, the topographical scarring pattern, combined together with the weather patterns, we can now postulate uh, exactly how the fire started, and we can model how it spread from there into Nisner with the wind patterns, uh, as Clinton explained, at different hours. So in looking at this, uh, what we have concluded with a very high degree of statistical probability is that the cause of the fire is mo most likely human activity. Again, We've also, Clinton's also looked at the possibility of other reports and so on, and we tried to see if we model that against the wind patterns and so on, the evidence doesn't corroborate that. So what we can see is the evidence corroborates the start of the fire at that particular clearing, and it's, and it's consistent with the weather patterns, and it's also consistent with human activity, that's it. That's the, that's the conclusion of our report. We've got the evidence to justify that, and obviously that will be shared with you. Thanks. I'm just going to hand over to Kumisa to take and, and manage the questions. Thank you very much for that detailed scientific report. Um, we'll be taking a round of questions. We'll take about three at a time, and then we'll allow our panel to respond. May I ask that you please just remember to switch on your mic and then switch it off again once you're done with your question. Um, we'll start, um, then you just give us your name and your media house and then the question, please. Thank you. Can you elaborate on what you mean by human activity? I just want to ask, uh, in your opinion, with the evidence found at the scene and also you were talking about uh, a person who was reported in, reportedly seen in the area on several occasions, do you think that this fire may have been started de deliberately? Thank you. Any last question? Uh, just uh, 
for ease of reporting, uh, can we have a sort of a, a, a location as to where it started? Um, name of an area, name of a farm, uh, yeah, that sort of thing. Thanks. Thank you. We'll just um, allow our panel to respond. And just to let you know, we will have the um, report available on our website by close of business today. I should be sending the link to everyone that's here. I think when, when, when we refer to human activity, what you mean is that fire at the bottom, that in that clearing, was started by somebody. Um, that's our definition of human activity. The second one about persons being reported, I don't think we, we have reported on that, that people reported in the area there. Uh, what we have said was there were several fires, evidence of several fires in that area at the bottom. Um, I did not find people, nobody reported us people in the area. Uh, I cannot say that the fire was set deliberately. Uh, what we do know is that people set fires for various reasons, uh, but we cannot at this stage say that the fire was set deliberate or by accident, or it was a controlled fire which got out of control. That we cannot say. In terms of the name of the farm, we do know that it was the Usi Schultz farm um, in, uh, in, in the, the Elands Kral area. And the section that we refer to as the V pattern, it is just below her house. Um, uh, well, her house is that one that you saw obliterated by the fire. It's U S I E Schultz. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Manuel. Um, any other questions? Uh, what's going to happen now? What's the status of the report? Is it on, in, ongoing? And are you seeing that there's human activity as you described it? Is it a matter now for the police, or what, what is the status? What, what are you going to do from here on? Okay, I, th I think this is the, f the first show of the report. The report, I think, at this point in time is going to be made public. Secondly, the matter will be raised with the police. Uh, and certainly, the evidence, uh, the forensic evidence that we've got from this particular report will be presented to the police and they would investigate further because they have the resources to do so. Um, thank you, Mr. Chetty. Um, any other questions? With Stephen? Um, sorry, guys. Along with, obviously, the fire report, the, the cause, this is more directed at the MM and, and um, the mayor. Along with the, uh, with the full fire report, will we also get a full tally then of everything that was destroyed, uh, etc., and also then uh, what your plans for are with the finances and donations, etc. Okay, I think I just we anticipated that question. <laughs> um, when we look at the full tally of everything that is burnt from a health perspective, environmental, education, human <coughs> settlements, local government, environmental affairs transport, social development, and businesses. From, from the side of the municipality, this excludes private losses, by the way. The estimates are anywhere between four to five billion rands. That's the, the estimates that we have at the moment. In terms of looking at the infrastructure damage that is directly the municipality and other government departments, the total cost is in the region of 496 million rands. And if I can break that down, we can see that the damage to, uh, if I look at specifically health infrastructure, it's about uh, one point. 3 million rands to the clinics, agriculture, uh, close to about 40 million rands in the Neisner area. And I'm going to leave out George and Beto from that, but we can give you the figures if you need it. Uh, human settlements, close to about 61 million rands. Uh, water, 
as a result of this and the drought, close to 91 million rands. Uh, and that's only for Naisna as well. Environmental damage of about, it's very difficult to estimate environmental damage, but environmental infrastructure, as we understand it, is close to about 134 million rands. And let me just say, this, this number ticks up because there are a number of homes that have asbestos, and the removal of asbestos in this country is highly regulated. There are very few organizations that are accredited to remove asbestos, and that number is incredibly high. We're looking at about, uh, with our disaster management person, uh, how much roughly for the environment, uh, the asbestos? 50.4 million, just around the removal of asbestos in that regard. Uh, transport and public works, we're looking at around 8 million to rehabilitate this. Social development uh, and, you know, all kinds of other relief measures that we want to provide is roughly about uh, 20, 25.3 million rands. So that just gives you an estimate. We can give you a breakdown of that if, if you need any additional information, Stefan. The mayor? No, no, no. I just want to see. You know, and ask if there are no other questions. I would just like to make a final comment. Any other questions or <coughs> nothing for today? Okay. Um, Madam Mayor, please. Uh, thank you very much once again. I just would like uh, really the media to be very mindful uh, of naming, um, um, for instance, um, as was indicated by Clinton, um, Ms. Shores. Reason being, as we have said, there is going to be a process now. Obviously, there needs to be uh, engagement with the, the land, uh, the owner of that private land to explain what has happened. So I would really like us to be mindful of that because out of that meeting, obviously, that engagement will have to start. Thank you very much. I just also want to add that, you know, when I started up, I said we're in the, you know, in the age of social media. So we've seen in social media a lot of people coming up saying, well, we can just put up this fire and we can get volunteers and so on. And I think we need to guard against certain irresponsible statements. What is clear from fire professionals is that when you have underground fire, you don't know what precisely would be the impact if we start walking on it, or if you take any weight and put it on it. That land could collapse, and you could go into an underground fire, which is about three, four, five hundred degrees Celsius. But the second point is, if you intervene, you also have to be careful. Because the moment you make a hole in the ground, you can allow oxygen to go in, and the moment oxygen goes in, the fire can, you know, start to spread again. So in, in this regard, we're saying that there ha we have to be very careful about any of these statements and be professional about it. So I would urge, I think the media here particularly, to help us in trying to get this awareness out that we cannot, without the assistance of professionals, give solutions to fires from a layperson's view, right, which may cause more harm than actually solving the problem. So all I'm saying is we have professional fire people and the fire chief is available and we can assist with whatever methodologies people have to put off the fires. But to make statements and say that you've got the answers without professional, uh, you know, without professional oversight of that, I think would be highly irresponsible. Um, thank you to our panel. Uh, there is tea and coffee um, on, in the foyer, and thank you for coming.